But the prioress must have seen the virgin to have said such a thing. On still another occasion, Sister Bernadette heard that the virgin had consulted Mother Cecilia on the position of the statue's arms. I ask her, is it true, Mother, that you were the one who told Our Lady that you would prepare her to be with extended hands than on her breast? She said, yes, because she looks more motherly with that position. These enigmatic last remarks of the prioress is one of many signs that the story of Lipa has not yet ended. For even way back in the 1950s, circumstances seemed to prepare the way, as it were, for the reinvestigation of Lipa at some future, more hospitable time. Teresing, for one, was prevented by her deteriorating health from returning to Carmel, where access to her testimony would have been difficult. Some of the nuns who were vital witnesses likewise left Carmel for a variety of reasons, a circumstance which enabled them to speak freely on the events either as lay persons or as members of other congregations, foregoing the need of obtaining permission from the Bishop of Lipa. Sister Stephanie, for instance, left Carmel in 1952 and could not re-enter because of her failing health. She subsequently married a Lipa convert, Guillermo Milan. Mother Therese of the Holy Face left in 1966 to found her own congregation. Sister Clotilde, then known as Monica of the Savior, left Carmel because she was diagnosed as tubercular, but upon subsequent examination at the Quezon Institute was found to be completely healthy. But perhaps even more intriguing is that Mother Cecilia, aside from affirming the authenticity of the apparitions, apparently also believed that the Virgin would return to Carmel. Two weeks before her death, she spoke again to Sister Bernadette. She told me that uh, the year is ending and Our Lady is not yet here. Because she's always expecting that Our Lady is coming back. Testimonies as to Mother Cecilia's character also make it difficult to associate such a woman with deception. Especially on a large scale as would have been necessary for a phenomenon like Lipa. Mother Cecilia was known for her virtue and her gentle, motherly care, and was very much loved by all those who came in contact with her. I don't think she was telling the, any lie to us. Yes, I trust there. Why did you trust Mother Cecilia? I know she is good. She is a holy, a holy woman. The first papal nuncio of the Philippines, Monsignor Ehidio Bagnozzi, fellow arch-conservative and friend of Cardinal Ottaviani, went on in 1958 to become apostolic delegate in Washington, after which he was recalled and made cardinal in 1967 and appointed president of the Prefecture of the Economic Affairs of the Holy See. We quote from his short biography in the book, The Inner Elite. This was a big disappointment to him. Earlier he had thought himself in line for the papacy and he had counted at least in getting a major post in the Curia. What he ended up with was a sinecure, the title and salary, without effective control of the operations of this major Vatican financial institution. Monsignor Rufino J. Santos, initially apostolic administrator, then Archbishop of Lipa, went on to become Archbishop of Manila and the first Filipino cardinal. Failing health, specifically a serious heart condition, prevented Teresita Castillo from returning to Carmel. In her own words, she cried and cried for over two years. Her separation from the religious life caused her such deep grief that in an effort to lift her spirits, her parents persuaded her to go on a European tour which was led by Monsignor Santos. Eight priests also comprised a part of the tour group, among them Monsignor Casas, who had also been a part of the investigative commission. One cannot help but wonder, why were these officials of the church not more circumspect or wary about being seen with Teresita Castillo? After all, she had been labeled a fraud, a crackpot, or judged by some to have been the victim of an overactive imagination that had duped an entire nation. In fact, Monsignor Santos continued for some time to function somewhat as her spiritual director and had become a family friend. 
spending a few vacations at their farm and at times saying mass at their home. Up until the last few years of his life, Teresing would visit him at the Cardinal's villa at least once a month for confession or an occasional dinner. It was only a little over a year ago that she discovered his role in the sentence on Lipa. Upon his recommendation, she began to work with Father Leo English at the Redemptorist Church in Baclaran, assisting in the now very popular English Tagalog dictionaries, a job she continues to hold to this day. Of course, malicious tongues have commented on what has evolved into a lasting friendship, for Teresing has continued to serve and nurse Father English, whom she affectionately calls Lolo, the Filipino word for grandfather. Sometime in the early 1960s, she was involved in a vehicular accident, which resulted in an injury to the nerve at the base of her brain. This brought on epileptic seizures. However, after two years of medication, the seizures disappeared. She never married, but adopted an infant left on the steps of Baclaran Church. Grace Irene is now a lively, intelligent, 19-year-old college student. Mother and daughter lead a very quiet and unobtrusive life in the suburbs of Manila. In obedience to the church, she has never spoken publicly about the apparitions, nor issued any statements to the press, despite the proliferation of newspaper and magazine articles maligning her and criticizing the events of Lipa. However, because of the escalating demand to reopen the investigation, and after much prayer and consultation with her spiritual directors, she reluctantly consented to tell her story. Quite understandably, she is nervous about the resurgence of interest in the case and has tried to prepare herself for the controversies that she knows will come. Teresing has to this day had to contend with accusations of insanity and fraud. caused the church's rather hasty pronouncement on the apparitions of Lipa. Premised as it was on questionable grounds and on what seemed to be a rather flawed investigation. Such efforts by the church hierarchy to clamp down on reported supernatural manifestations also characterized other supposed apparitions in other parts of the world. Since 1933, more than 200 other presumed revelations have suffered the same fate. It is curious, though, that there was a series of so-called apparitions that occurred in the late 1940s that somehow seem related to Lipa. We refer to two in particular. Our Lady of All Nations, which began in Amsterdam on March 1945 and lasted for over 14 years, and the Great Mediatrics of Graces, which occurred in 1946 in Marienfried, Pfaffenhofen, Germany. In Marienfried, she requested, as she did in Fatima, and as she was said to have done two years later in Lipa, for the Saturday devotion. And the apparition of Amsterdam was by far one of the most controversial, as it dealt, as did the apparition of the Virgin of the Revelation in Trefontane, Rome, with the incorruptibility of her body, and surprisingly, with a pronouncement regarding the development of a last dogma in Marian history. It is pointed out that though there have been two negative pronouncements on this apparition, the much celebrated statue of the Virgin of Akita, whose locutions and accompanying supernatural events have been recognized by Bishop Ito and upheld by the Japanese Conference of Bishops, was inspired by the painting supposedly requested by the Lady of All Nations. In this apparition, she called on all Christian peoples to band themselves together and asked that the theologians see their battle for the Marian dogma through to the finish, assuring them of her help, revealing that she was being sent by the Lord and Master who wanted to give this world spiritual oneness. I come as co-redemptrix mediatrix at this time. Co-redemptrix I was already at the Annunciation. This means that the mother became co-redemptrix by the will of the father. 
Tell your theologians this. Tell them, moreover, that this will be the last dogma in Marian history. This picture shall prepare the way. Have this picture brought to the whole world, and thereby I mean the whole world, not only your country. The world is degenerating. The world is being afflicted with disaster upon disaster. The world will be, and is, economically and materially, at a dead end. Wars will continue until the spirit of truth comes in with his help. Get the people back to the cross. Canon René Laurentin, theologian, leading Mariologist and author, explains that especially during the post-war years, the Catholic hierarchy as a whole was simply not predisposed to such mystic phenomena as apparitions of the Virgin Mary or of any other heavenly being. In his report on the church and apparitions, he points out that there was a period of effective repression and that apparitions suffered from the great severity of Cardinal Alfredo Ottaviani, assessor of the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office. We quote, This rigorous and traditional man was responsible for the matter of private revelation and took harsh action through his decisions and imperative orders to bishops. It was through his influence, so it seems, that Bishop Halen, who was favorable to the apparitions of Borang, was removed from the decision process. He was very severe for apparition and uh, charism, special, extraordinary charism. Uh, he put uh, on to different causes of canonization, like uh, Yvonne Aimé de Maletrois or uh, the Polish uh, sister Faustina. Uh, I think during the war it was troubled time. Uh, he was afraid to see tendency to illuminism, and uh, illuminism. Yes. And uh, <coughs> for this reason, he thought he had to be severe. The ultra conservative Cardinal Ottaviani, also known as the Holy Terror of the Holy Office, or Big Brother in a cassock was described as probably being the most feared man in the Vatican and had often acted as a self-defined policeman of its faith and morals, was retired by Paul VI in 1967. Three years later, the floodgates were open when that same pope abolished the canon law that forbade any publication about apparitions. According to Laurentin, Ottaviani's successor, Cardinal Sepper, proved to be more open and flexible, and it was in this spirit that he worked out the new criteria for judging the nature of the presumed apparitions and revelations. Laurentin, who was consulted on the criteria, says that this attitude of openness is shared by John Paul II. With uh, our new pop, uh, everything is more open because he has a very good and open religious sensibility to every type of action of God. He wants not to put the action of God in a square, but to see where God is doing something. And it is also my way. Efforts are underway to have the Lipa case reopened for investigation. In July 1982, Francisco Di Chanco, together with Nelly Kison, Cruz Laurel and some others formed the Marian Research Center, which collected testimonies and information relating to the events of 1948. They gathered more than 5,000 signatures from the laity, pressing Lipa Archbishop Mariano Gaviola to have the apparitions of Lipa re-investigated. Well, it is our pastoral duty to listen to the faithful to pay respect to their own feelings. But we have also to safeguard the welfare of the church in general. And that is where the, the problem of making a decision lies quite heavily. There was one thing that was quite also revealing. It was uh, a letter from our then apostolic nuncio, 
the Archbishop Carmine Rojo. This letter was dated something like 1970. And in the letter, what struck me is this, that it just says that with reference to this thing, please uh, know that it has been found that the deported operations were uh, real and pious imposture. There, at least there were around four bishops who told me, what for it? What for it? That's it. Are their conversions happening? In August of 1989, a small group of Lipad devotees began to get together every Saturday to honor Mary and to pray for the reopening of the investigation into the events of Lipa. Unbeknown to them, they were fulfilling one of the requests she had made in 1948. Forty years of silence were eclipsed in a matter of months, and the first penitential procession in honor of Mary, Mediatrix of All Grace, was held three months later. And public declaration of the events of 1948 revealed for the first time since the proclamation of the unfavorable verdict. At the end of the ceremonies, testimonies were made on recent cures attributed to the intercession of Mary Mediatrix. Are there phenomenal healings happening? Luz Palmares related the miraculous healing of her son, Raymond Julius, who suffered from a mitral valve prolapse, enlargement of the heart, and various other vascular illnesses. Aside from that, he had a cleft palate and couldn't speak normally. She began a novena to Mary, Mediatrix of all grace, hung a scapular with a petal around her son's neck, and within a few months, his condition improved so dramatically that the operation recommended by the doctors was no longer necessary. Moreover, Julius soon found that he could speak normally. Uh, I'm uh, Raymond Julius Palmares. How old are you, Raymond? Uh, I'm 20, uh, uh, 22 years old. And what do you do? Uh, I'm a music teacher from uh, St. Bridget's College High School Department. Panginoon, narito ako. In February 1990, a strange phenomenon was reported in the Granja district of Lipa, a few blocks away from Carmel. A luminous white outline of what seemed to be a woman in prayer began to appear in the evenings on one of the leaves of a tall coconut tree. Then 15-year-old R.J. Garcia, a member of the Protestant fundamentalist born-again movement, was reportedly the first to see it. He was convinced that it was the Virgin and has since been receiving instruction in the Catholic faith. Many saw it too. And soon crowds from all over Metro Manila and the outlying provinces flocked to Granja. The phenomenon received considerable print, TV and radio coverage. The luminous figure was visible from about 6.30 in the evening to the early hours of dawn. Some say other figures were visible as well, such as that of St. Bernadette, and others claim to have seen tiny twinkling lights dotting the leaves of the coconut tree. Some theorize that the image was merely projected onto the leaf by some trickster or the reflection from the nearby lamppost. But others counted that it couldn't have been a reflection as the image would remain intact on the leaf no matter the direction the wind would blow it to. But there are those who claim to have seen more than an illumination on a leaf. When we arrived there at the scene and look upon the tree, instead of seeing the Fatima, I told my wife, no, it's not the Fatima, it's the Our Lady of Miraculous Medal. Because the veil is blue, it's not all white, and, and, his, and her hair is spread like this. So, I, and my mother, ah, I'm seeing also the same thing. I was crying, I was trembling. The silhouette was visible for 90 consecutive evenings. Then, on May 21st, the day after the silhouette ceased to appear, Sister Alphonse, the nun who had seen Teresing's sightless eyes in 1948, passed away. We were told that before she died, she had repeatedly asked when she would be interviewed for the Keithley report, as she had much to tell. Her dying request was to have the image of Our Lady Mediatrix of All Grace exposed in the chapel of Carmel. The day afterwards, with the permission of Archbishop Gabiola, 
the controversial statue was brought out and displayed for the first time in over 40 years. On January 24, 1991, petals were again reported to have fallen at Lipa, Carmel. Terry Singh, her driver, and a real estate agent were inside the church in front of the statue of the Mediatrix when petals suddenly fell from nowhere. Yung mga roses, parang nagmula sa kawalan, malalam, mataas pa dito sa halaman na ito. At unti-unting nagkalaglagan, and parang hindi basta bigla, yung parang nagsiswing kung mag, ano, paglaglag. Ngayon, puting-puti ang mga roses. Wala nang pure na pure na puti. Hindi, hindi kami magsalita. Bawa ko pang Panginoon, kako. Patawarin mo po ako, kako. Nangwas agad ako, kako. Kako, kung ito man, kako, milagro. Kako, patawarin niyo po ako, kako. Ganyan. Naku, sa so, anong nakita ni Sister Silin, oh, naku, sabi niya, nang milagro si Mama Mary. It's miracle, it's miracle. The incident made a deep impression upon Mang Maning. Ang kuwan ko ba yung, yung feeling ko ba sa Panginoon na na... Barang kako pinbaka may mensahe sa akin na ano minag pinagmilagroan ako kasi hindi ko naman ako pala simbay. Ngayon, mula noon, binigyan ako ni Sister Celine ng ng Bible at saka prayer book at saka ano, sabi niya magsimba. At parang damdamin ko parang ayaw ko ba hindi ko ma-explain sa iyo. <laughs> kasi minsan alam mo pag ganyan Parang ko na ko parang emo laka ng ng laki ng emosyon ko hindi ko mapigil parang maluwa ba ko ma miyak pero sa talang buhay ko hindi pa ko miyak uh, kahit ano mga problema A few days afterwards six children playing in the garden at Carmel reportedly saw the statue of the Virgin of Carmel come to life Nakita ko po eh nag yung pong mata ay eh, lumuluha po saka po yung papay nag close feet Noon po kami nagdasal, nakita ko pong umiiyak. Bago pagkatapos po namin magdasal, ngumiti po. Malambot, yung ano po, damit. Noong inawakan ko po dun sa damit, eh, malambot po. Inawakan ko po yung, yung pong damit, eh, lumubog po yung ano, yung kamay po. Ay, yung pong kamay ko, lumubog po, lampasan po. Nakita ko po, ito pong damit po ay nasa salimpar po ng hangin. Hinawaan ko po yung, yung palad, eh, na, naramdaman ko po na malambot. Pagkahalik ko po sa paa, na, nakita ko po na naramdaman po, naramdaman ko po, um, para nga po ang um, paa na nagalaw. This is extraordinary and it is another factor for me to be prompted to to, to study this, really. In the last six months, petal showers occurred with some regularity in Terracing's home. It's sort of here, on this level, fluttering, sort of suspended in the air. In fact, the petal showers progressed to another stage. Several witnesses were present when full roses materialized out of thin air and landed on the stairs, altar, and bedroom of the Castillo home and Terracing reports, with joy and apprehension, that she has begun to receive messages from Mary again. If at all we are going to reopen this, we will do this as secretly as possible, or as, as privately as possible, so that the composition or the members of the commission will not be under some sort of uh, too much uh, pressure and they might be exposed to even their own personal biases. On July 16, the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Archbishop Mariano Gaviola declared that the controversial image of Mary Mediatrix of All Grace would, for the entire duration of his term as Archbishop, be exposed to the public in the chapel of the Carmelite convent of Lipa. The list of healings attributed to the petals and intercession of the Mediatrix continues to grow and lay groups are busily gathering the testimonies. 
Prayers continue at Carmel every Saturday, and penitential processions wind their way around the town. The wait is on. In the meantime, after more than 40 years, it's showering petals again. Today's world can dismiss the petal showers as merely paranormal instead of supernatural, insisting that certain individuals are capable of bringing about incidents of extraordinary phenomena. We can always explain everything away. But then the question is, through all this rationalization, where have we left room for God? This is June Keithley for the sixth in the series of The Woman Clothed with the Sun. <laughs>